Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series. And I have a great show today. You know, from watching the show, we always talk about talent integration. I mean, it's so important to get a competitive advantage in the digital landscape. And of course, growing your technology team is very important, especially in this fast paced, sort of technologically advanced and improving sort of landscape that we have right now. And we've been able to invite on the show a leader in the space. He really helps companies grow their technology teams. And he's involved with talent integration and he gives companies a very big competitive advantage in their particular tech stack and their particular tech landscape through his company, Miragos. And his name, of course, is Zenia Rosinski. He's a leader in the space. He's been doing this for a long time. You can Google him. There's a lot of great information about him. And we, we're very fortunate to have him on the show today. So Zenia, welcome to the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series today. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. You're all about helping your clients. The, the case studies are remarkable. Before we get started, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet. Tell us about Miragos, and then we're going to get into it. So a very elevator type pitch. Uh, what we do is we help our clients really hire the best talent in around technology, right? So we call it technology, but it's really anything related to, to software development, right? We've got obviously software developers, DevOps, anything related to that, but we also have product managers, project managers, uh, product designers. And so really anything that contributes to designing a, a good software. Yeah. And what we do is we hire people from across Latin America and Europe, and we place them with our clients, mostly in the United States, but we have some international as well. The idea being, fundam it used to be, people would go, when they wanted to hire remotely, they would go to outsourcing shops. And outsourcing shops are great, but they have some fundamental flaws in the business model. Not It's not to say that the company is bad, it's just the way the business model works. And my background, I spent years and years in technology leadership. I was a CTO, I was a VP of engineering. I started several of my own uh, companies in the past, and I figured that that problem can be solved. And so that's how Mirigus was, uh, was born. Yeah, I love it. You're solving a big problem for so many clients. But before we get into it, because we want to talk about how you source top-notch employees who really work directly and under the guidance of supervision and supervision of not only you, but your client. What types of customers reach out to you? What types of clients reach out and they say, hey, Xenia, we've heard about what you're doing. We want in. So all of our clients are the people that already have engineering talent, engineering leadership in place. We don't get a lot of people that come in and go, hey, I have an idea. I need somebody to build it because that's where you need the actual product expertise in that particular area. What we do is, let's say there's a client, they have a team of engineering, could be two people, could be five people, could be 25 people or 500. They come to us and they say, you know, we're looking for good engineers. We're looking for senior people, mid-level people to integrate in our team, right? We know how to manage them. We know what to do. We don't need you to deliver the product. We know exactly what to do. Help us out. But on the flip side, we have no idea how to recruit in other countries. We have no idea how to attract talent in other, in other countries because it's very different. People know how to recruit in the United States. People know what what's important to a potential employee in the U.S. It's different in other regions, and it's country-specific, not, not just region-specific. And also what we do is we obviously take care of all the logistics. How do you pay all of these people? How do you comply with the local laws? How do you manage HR, right? Because again, in the US, we sort of know we can read the body language. We understand how things work. We we know when you start dealing with somebody in a, in other places in, in the world, right? I often get, well, I talk to this person, they looked in the screen and they didn't say a word. What does it mean? And that's where we come in with our expertise to try to explain and help. Yeah, it's interesting. Of course, you're able to hire top-notch engineering talent from Latin America and Europe and elsewhere. 
How do you vet those people? How do you find the people that you're going to integrate into your clients' businesses? Do you have people that reach out? Do they reach out to you because they've heard about you? How do you find the talent from these different countries? So the process is interesting. So there, there are two steps, right? There are two sides of the process. First, we understand what the customer needs. And our, our, our understanding of a customer's needs, it's not a just a job description. We always need a job description. We need you to give us something in writing. Hey, here's what I'm looking for. But then we go and we really start asking questions. Who are you looking for? Right? I, I get the skill set, but who are you looking for? What type of environment? Things that you just can't put on paper, right? Things that how do you explain I'm looking for a person that has that type of personality? You, you don't put it in a job description. So we, we get all of that. And then uh, we have um, we, recruiters, right? So we have a team of about 30 recruiters uh, all over the world. So all of our recruiters are local, meaning we don't do it from one location. So for Latin America, we've got people in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, in, you know, in all the different countries. In Europe, same thing. We've got people in all the different countries, which makes it a lot more interesting and a lot more advantageous for us to, to hire because, again, it's local. There's the other side of the recruiting, and that's where we're really good at. So our competitors, right, our biggest competitors are outsourcing companies. And outsourcing company, when they hire somebody, they hire for themselves. So let's say company XYZ, they, they have a client and they go to a potential candidate and they say, I am XYZ, I have a position, come work for me. And when you work for me, you're going to be assigned to client A. Our uh, pitch is completely different. Hey, I am Mirgis, ignore me. Company A is looking for somebody with your skill sets. Do you want to be part of company A? Meaning you're part of the core team, you're part of the decision process, you're part of the team, you know, the, the actual team that's building the product. And that excites people because they don't want to be a widget in somebody else's wheelhouse, right? So they don't want to go into uh, outsourcing company. I mean, they do, right? But they work for outsourcing company and the outsourcing company will move them from project to project. The outsourcing company will... Um, reassign them we don't right when we get a client that client or when we get a candidate that candidate works for that client forever and ever and ever as long as that lasts wow the way you do it at miragos really makes sense it really builds a loyalty it builds it a, a a corporate culture and it's it's really fantastic so they know they're just not what you call a widget but they're someone that's going to be valued and when people feel valued and they feel that they're part of a team, they do a much better job. Now, let's talk, Zenia, about the countries. What countries are burgeoning with you know, developers and technologists that you see that you say to yourself, boy, I wish I could get a lot more technologists from this country? Interestingly enough, there's no simple, straightforward answer. Each region, countries are, there's... You can get specific to countries, but we can talk about regions and then get into countries. Each region has its qualities, right? And for some people, it works better. For others, it doesn't. So, for example, when we originally started, we started in uh, Eastern Europe, specifically in Ukraine. So we started hiring in Ukraine, and the idea was absolutely amazing, right? People were good. People were very creative. People know how to solve problems. The downside, there's a time difference. Right? If somebody in most of our clients in the Pacific time zone, California, you know, that's where all the technology companies are, obviously. So it's a 10 hour time difference. It's not impossible. It's very doable. We have a lot of clients. We have a lot of people there, but it creates a challenge. Years later, we expanded to other countries in, in Europe, but then we went into Latin America. Latin America has a bit of a different mentality, has a bit of a different mindset, if you will, but the time difference is a lot better, and right? you're dealing with two, three, four hours time difference for the most part. And so it makes it a lot, a lot easier. So when we go to our clients, we always tell them, what, what do you prefer? And we explain, this is where the advantages of going to Europe, this is where the advantages of going to Latin America, what do you prefer? And in some cases, we'll sort of encourage them one way or another, because we know what, what, what would work better, and others, they know what they want. Um, I have a story, that's, and this is pretty interesting. So th and this does qualify um, regions. So I, I 
was a VP of engineering at one of the large companies, very large household name companies, running a very large team. And I had to build a team at um, uh, somewhere overseas, right? So, and I was wondering how, how would I do this? And we were analyzing, where do we do it? Do we do this in Asia, India, or do we do this in Europe? And then eventually, um, the idea was, right, so we were sort of joking about what's the advantage and disadvantage. And, you know, we, I work a lot with Indian and Asian uh, outsourcing companies, and they're great. They're great at following directions, right? So you tell them, do this, they will do exactly what you told them to do. But if you are, for example, you know, if you're saying, hey, do this, but it's not exactly how you described it for one reason or another, it'll probably not get done. So the story goes, I was presenting the case to our CTO and we were sitting in, a, in the office and the, the office had a window on the right side. And I said, here's the difference. If I'm going to send instructions to the team um, that we have, and we, we had a team, we had an existing team there. And we, we, I said instructions, and by accident, I'll say, I need you to wash a window on the left side, right? I made a mistake. It's on the right side, but it's on the left side. In the morning, there's going to be a response. There is no window on the left side. Fair enough. Now, I said, if you're doing this in Eastern Europe, again, this was Ukraine that we were evaluating at that time, I'm going to send the same thing. Hey, I need you to wash a window on the left side. When we're going to show up in the morning, there will be a window on the left, uh, on the left side, and it will be perfectly washed. Both are a problem. I just know how to solve one better than I know how to solve the other. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's interesting. So you think about it. When you have a company that reaches out to you and they say, hey, Zenia, we've heard about you and your team at Miragos. We want in, we need some help. We want to grow our technology team, our technology stack. We want to augment our business. We really want to enable your seamless talent integration, really to get a competitive edge at this point in time. Will you bring technologists in from different parts of the world or do you prefer to bring technologists in from one part of the world for one company or it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter at all. It really matters on the setup that particular company has. So we do, we see two types of things, right? We have a team of five. We need two people to integrate with this team. And then you can bring them from different parts of the world, same part, it doesn't matter. We have another uh, way people do this. They come to us and they say, hey, we want to build a team. So we have you know, a team of five, another team of five, another team of five. We want to build yet another team of five. So we need to hire more of a senior lead type of person and then hire four people to work with them. In that case, my recommendation is 100% do it in the same region. Again, not necessarily the same country, but the same region. Because they're working together very closely, it, it just makes sense. Yeah. You mentioned the Fortune 100, the Fortune 10 company that you've worked with, which is phenomenal. And I'm curious, because you do a lot of consulting work as well, you help companies understand the proper process and the right timing for your type of a solution. Does your solution work for startups as well as, let's say, companies that have, have evolved? Or do you recommend and consult with startups not to bring in outside software development and do it inside? Or what's the best way for startups to approach this? So in, as a matter of fact, most of our companies, most of our clients, we have companies from, you know, really small couple of people, they're just starting. We have publicly traded companies as our clients. So we have the, the whole range, but I would honestly say vast majority of our clients call themselves startups. And when I say call themselves startups, it could be a five people startup or it could be a 200 people, but they're still in a startup mentality, startup mode. Absolutely, I would say for startups, this is the best approach to go because startups are always money starving, right? They don't have funds. This, so going back, right? So it used to be startups had only one way. They could hire locally. That's all they could do. When they try to go outsourcing, that never worked really well. Investors don't like it. Uh, you know, customers don't like it. And then at the end of the day, what do you own? So if you have an outsourcing company that build a product for you, they got you, right? They can do whatever they want because even though technically on paper you own the code, they have all the knowledge. They have all the 
like everything belongs to them. So they can come back tomorrow and say, we're raising our price to X and what are you going to do? You, you, sure, you can say the code is mine, but who's going to figure this out? It's going to take forever. So it's never a good idea for startups to outsource. Well, let me rephrase it. It's never a good idea for anybody to outsource their core knowledge and their core business. Right? You want to outsource something that's done um, you know, as a site. With our model, you're not outsourcing anything. They're your employees. So the knowledge is yours. Everything is yours. They're not one company, right? They're they're distributed people. So if somebody decides they want to leave, it's one person leaving, just like an employee would be leaving here. So you don't put all the eggs in one basket. It's it's a absolutely one, better way. Um, in fact, I've had startups, and this is how I done it, right? I don't um, I don't hire here. I, I hire remotely. I get better talent much better rate, rates and, and everything. I love it. It makes all the sense in the world, of course. And you really have put together a program. And like you just mentioned, that makes a lot of sense for startups, whether they're a one-person startup, a five-person startup, or they're a hundred-person startup that has the mentality of a startup. Let's talk about it. So I'm a startup. I'm in AI. I've got five or 10 people working. I'm, you know, I've got some money behind me, not a lot, but I'm trying to get, you know, to that next level. And I reach out to you. How do you and your team manage it? In other words, what's the process? Once you find my, my team for me, how does that get integrated into my business? Do you have a streamlined sort of platform that you introduce the technology team into the startup in this case? How does that work? So our process is really so our, our, most of our process is around recruiting and interviewing and, and 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 doing that part, right? So again, you come in, we understand what you're looking for, we go, we start really you know, looking for candidates. We do a lot of in-house screening for every candidate that goes out. I would say only about thirty percent, probably even less than thirty percent of candidates that we get end up on your, you know, in your email as a candidate submitted to you. Um, the rest are being rejected because we know it's not going to be a fit. Um, so we we do our pre-screening with our recruiters. We actually have our own engineering team. We have our own engineer, engineering experts, not engineering team, but engineering experts that can do technical interviews. So we do, you know, all of, all of that required. Then it goes out to you and you follow your own interview process. We will facilitate that process, meaning we'll, we'll schedule everything, we'll make sure everything's happening, but it's your process. And each company has a different process. A lot of it depends on the size, a lot of it depends on, on various factors. But usually you'll do two to three rounds of interviews, just like you normally would. Uh, some of them are more technical, some of them are more personality type. And then eventually you're going to say, yes, this is somebody we like, we want to bring them on. From get-go, from the minute you got the resume, you know what the rate is. Um, and I, I should actually talk about how our rate system works and our pricing works. But so you know what um, what you get and uh, you say, yep, I, I'm interested. I want to go with this person. We can figure out some details. Sometimes right, we have to negotiate the salary with the person and it's all transparent with you, right? It all works with you. Um, we eventually say, okay, fine, we're moving forward. We're going to go and onboard that person into our system, right? So into our HR, into our payroll, into our the whole process that we have. So we onboard them. Once that's done, we'll send you an email uh, notification saying, hey, it's all ready. Here's the person. Here's the contact information. Go ahead, right? You're now, it, it, it's now your employee. And from that point on, um, just like you would onboard any full-time employee, right? You will set up their email, you will do their own training. We don't get involved in that. We do not get involved in training. And yet, our whole idea is to be invisible, right? That's the, the we, we want to stay out. <laughs> the less we're involved, the better the process works. That's awesome, Zenia. And of course, you have a brand new book that you've written called Global Talent, Local Results. I mean, it's just what we're talking about. Tell us a little bit about what sort of motivated you to write the book and uh, maybe even show us the book. I know it's probably right on your desk and give us a little view of the book as well. Sure. Uh, of course it is. So this is the book. Yep. It came out about six months ago. It's called Global Talent, Local Results. 
um, it's a it's a manual, really. This this book is is a manual on how different ways on how our clients, how people can structure companies, well, structure recruiting for their companies using global uh, market, right? It talks about different ways. It talks about differences between different models. It talks about even regions, something we've talked about a little bit, uh, like which ones are better and which ones are, you know, not necessarily better, but which ones may fit better the, to their particular need. Um, but uh, so far, we've gotten pretty good feedback. Um, Highly recommended. It. It's obviously it's on Amazon. If anybody contacts me, I'm happy to send a free copy to them. Um, so yeah, this there you go. This is the book. That makes sense. When I think about what you're doing, you offer what I call full control, and the Absolutely. companies really get to exercise complete control over their own team, mm -hmm. and they get to empower their team. They get to be the leaders to help their team excel, and they get to supervise all the deliverables and tasks and priorities that really ensures the alignment with that company's strategic goals. And you put those people in the position to do that. You did mention pricing. So let's get into that a little bit from a high level. I mean, you brought it up, so let's go. For sure. So I think pricing is incredibly important. We operate, so our pricing is very transparent. When we work with somebody, we are open about what salary that person is making and the fee that we're charging for that particular person. Our fees are flat. Um, they're flat. They're a little dependent on the area because of the costs, right? Inherited cost of the business, but they're flat fees. And why we're doing this? Why, why did I start this? So initially, when I actually started the business, I thought of doing this as a, as a percentage, and then no. my, my whole idea is I want to align my goal and my success with my client's goals and successes. Meaning, if I have two clients, uh, I'm sorry, two candidates, and one candidate wants X thousands of dollars and, as a salary, and the other one wants you know, X plus uh, $500, right? So $500 is the difference. I want the client to choose which one they want to bring on. I don't want any interest in that. I don't want to have any financial interest in what decision they're making. I don't want to push somebody who is cheaper because I'm going to be making more money. So the, the idea is it's it's transparent. Hey, here's person A, here's person B, you choose. Hey, this one's got a little bit more experience. Is that enough to pay them 500 bucks more? Is it not enough? Your, your decision. And yeah, we always advise, we help, we know the market, we know what the rates are. So we can always say, yeah, this is not reasonable, this is reasonable, but uh, but the goal is there. So that's number one. Number two, we run a very low overhead shop. Again, outsourcing, right? I keep talking about outsourcing because that's what people are thinking. That's what people know. Our model is fairly unique in, in how we do this. Outsourcing, their biggest expense is what's called the bench. Bench are people that are employed by the outsourcing company, but are not actively on the project. Success rate is about, successful company is about 10%, right? So about 10% of people are, are on, on the bench. Well, somebody's paying for it, right? So the 10% uh, overhead is right there built in, 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 in rates. We don't have a bench. And we don't have a bench for two reasons. We want to keep the overhead low, but not that. That's actually not why. When you're going to come to me and you say, I'm looking for a person with a skill set, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the one that pushes on you somebody who I happen to have that may not be the right fit for you, may not be the perfect fit. So I don't have anybody at all. Every, it costs us a lot more money for, to recruit, right? The, the idea is it costs us a lot more to recruit. And that's a cost of business that we're fine with. Because every time you come in, a new client comes in or existing client comes in for additional role, we go and recruit. Sure, we have pipelines. Sure, we work with people. So we know who we go to. It's not like starting from scratch every single time. We have a network of candidates. We know who we pre-vetted. We know who we interviewed. So we do it very, very fast. But it's not our own bench. Another thing is we don't have any hidden resources. A lot of companies have what's called hidden resources. Yeah, here's the team of five people, but really in the back, there's somebody else, like a project manager who supervises them, but they don't, we don't do this. You need a project manager, we're happy to hire a project manager for you. You need somebody else, we're happy to hire it, but we don't have any hidden resources. 
Yeah. And so that combined our uh, margins, and I, I'm open, I right, publicly open about it. Our margins are about 21% across the company. Yeah, it's really interesting because as a startup, you don't want to make mistakes because that's mm -hmm. big failure for a startup, especially when you're burning money or you know, you're know you burning your runway. So you want to make sure you align with the right person. And when you do that in the right company, when you augment your business, you have to do it right because by doing it right, you're going to increase not only your gross margins and your net margins, but ultimately your your gross revenue, which is very important, especially in this day and age. And I think this talent integration that you offer, Zenia, is really, really an awesome way for not only startups to get ahead of the pack and not have to worry about hiring locally, but come to you to sort of make their team a powerhouse team that gives them a competitive advantage. Now, let's talk about entrepreneurship. I know I've only cut out a certain amount of time. You're so busy, you know, talking to people all over the world and Zoom calling and traveling everywhere. Let's talk to the entrepreneurs uh, watching the show today, Insania, because some of them, and we just spoke about startups, maybe they're having a tough time. Maybe they're freezing in the frame. They don't know what to do. Maybe based on your 20 plus years of experience as an entrepreneur and a C-level executive, you could share with the younger entrepreneurs watching the show about what it takes to get through a tough time in business and keep on pushing. What an awesome question. And these days it's so timely, right? Uh, we're watching with startups, particularly, I work a lot with startups. I work a lot with uh, as an advisor, um, as a mentor with startups and 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 guys that are starting the companies. I had the saying that I came up with years ago, and it's called, and I say this, build businesses, not startups. I think it's important to understand that a startup is not a hobby. Startup is a business. And so many people are focused on all these things around startups, right? The, the, the cool factor of it. We're going to be raising money. We're going to go to conferences. We're going to do this and this, this. And that's all great. This is part of the culture. This is part of, we have fun with it. But at the end of the day, it's you're building a business. So if you're not sure, if you're having a hard time, put everything else aside. Think of two things. Who is your customer? What problem you're solving? How you can solve it? And why would they pay money for it? Wow. That's it. It's If you answer those questions, I think it'll really paint a picture for you of where to move and what to do. I love it. For the people watching the show, rewind what Zenia just said. He just basically gave you a Harvard MBA in less than 30 seconds. I mean, I can see that build businesses, not startups being the name of your TED Talk. I mean, I love that so much. Maybe that'll be the name of your next book, Zenia. And I wanted to thank you for coming on the show, giving us some insight into Miragos. It's really powerful. I love it. It sort of gives people and startup founders and and uh, more evolved entrepreneurs and business owners, mid-sized companies, large companies, a different way to think about integrating something that's very powerful to give them a competitive advantage. And in this day and age, everybody needs a Zenia on their side. So Zenia, I wanted to thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. on the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. It was great having you on the show. And thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you. <laughs>